this was the first summer for a lot of people on this new diet. And so there were you know, some things, we're still learning how to cook this way. And of course the apples came in, so you had apple pie, and then no ice cream, except this one couple said, hmm. <laughs> so they made ice cream of the woman's milk and served that on the pie. Because <laughs> we said, that's okay, that's kosher. <laughs> And I later found out, this was a Jewish couple, that rabbis actually say that mother's milk is kosher. So the, the thing is that we found that that whole thing worked better if you laugh a lot. And, and we were also finding that out about childbirth, is that it goes easier if you could ever manage to laugh. And it is kind of funny because, you know, water breaks and, you know, inconvenient places and times. And, you know, you just have to relax a little bit and go, okay, um, this, so this is what birth is like. There was no, you have to factor in, there was nothing like television today where you can see birth at any time of night or day. But it's generally, you know, you're going to see an epidural or you're going to see a C-section, but you're not really going to see the baby coming out because they, they blur it, don't they? You know, when, you, when you, it starts to get the most interesting, sorry, censored, <laughs> we can't see it. It's coming out from a place that's just so socially destructive that we would ever see this that, you know, we're going to take you and you can see the incision instead because it's okay to see, watch her get cut open, watch the blood flow, and watch them digging around to get the baby out. But we can't watch a baby be born naturally. I think if we could see what we midwives get to see all the time, that women wouldn't be so afraid uh, because it's actually rather pretty <laughs> a lot of the time. And... Uh, and you can also find out that even, this is something that you'll never find in a medical text, but the expression on the woman's face actually has a lot to say about whether she has a tear or not. Did you ever hear that before? I learned that watching the first 50 births because I had the privilege of being with people that didn't, imagine, didn't get mad at me or feel invaded if I really checked them out while they're having the baby. And of course I could because when you have a baby in a little school bus, whether it's in the middle of the winter or in the hot summer, you're going to get, you're going to get naked. You're going to throw things off because it just feels awful to have cloth touching you unless you're in a freezing place while you're having a baby. And of course we weren't. And so I could see what was going on. I could look at the entire woman. And, and so I learned there was a whole lot to do with uh, what your mood is. And, uh, and I learned things that it, uh, weren't in any book. For instance, there was one woman who, um, she was a good friend, and she was having the first baby, and was, this was birth, birth 42 or something like that. So, you know, I've been to quite a few, and more than half of them had been first-time mothers, and she was one of those. And so she labored and got to eight centimeters fairly quickly, and I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to get to see this baby born before I have to go on this trip this afternoon. And then things kind of slowed down because we'd been laughing and joking and having a, the usual good time because, you know, when you have the you know, so-called pains or contractions, which we usually called rushes because I didn't like those words too much because not everybody had pain, things they would call pains. I didn't. Um, you didn't either? Yeah. I enjoyed it. <laughs> so. You know, what do you do with this? Some women say, oh, it's the worst thing, the worst feeling I've ever had. And other people went, hey, that's not bad. That's kind of exciting. <laughs> you know, so we had both kinds. And, and then we also had some women that didn't even know what was going on, didn't even think they were in labor. Okay, so in this particular case, here's this woman. Suddenly everything's kind of quieted down, and I'm going, hmm, I wonder if I, this baby is going to come. I ask her if I can check her again, and she says yes, and I find out that she's only four. And she didn't do anything that I could see to change that. How, I, I never knew anybody could undilate their cervix before. I'd never, ever read that in a book, and I'd read quite a few medical books by that time. And I told her, I said, you know, I know your cervix can open because it already did. I'm positive that you were eight centimeters. And I notice now that you're not laughing at our stupid jokes anymore. Oh, that's the only difference I can see in how you're being. So why don't you go back to laughing and see if that will fix things. And she also did something, uh, you know, when she'd usually cough, I knew what that sounded like. And now if she needed to cough, she'd go <coughs> like that, you know. 
you could tell that she was really trying not to sort of activate something deeper going on. So um, she started laughing again, and guess what? She opened up and had her baby. So I'd learned something really important, that labor can go backwards in women. And of course, I kind of knew that would happen with animals, because I remember my aunt, you know, would t tell stories, you know, and um, also, you know, the kids here, if they ever wanted to see a foal born, that would be the only time that we allowed them to have uh, soda pop that was caffeinated. And so they would drink, you know, you know, something like that all night until they would just go to sleep anyway, and that's when the horse would foal. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's how it is, you know, because they don't want to be watched, you know. The brain doesn't like to be observed when we're doing letting something very big come out. That's why bathroom stalls are private for the most part, okay? So uh, I went to the med medical books to see, maybe I just hadn't read them carefully enough. I went to the medical library and I looked. I thought, this has got to be recorded. And it wasn't in a single book. And then I would go out and speak to a bunch of nurses and midwives. And, and all those who had worked for a while were familiar with this that sometimes you, you check somebody's dilation and then you write it down in the chart and then you come back later and they're way smaller. And you go, what's that? And then I said, well, don't you? And they said, well, they always just say we've made a mistake. Doctor says we've made a mistake. And uh, doctors didn't know about this either. But I said, well, then if it happens, why isn't it in the book? I thought they're supposed to have everything in the book that happens. And I realized that the doctors didn't know because they didn't t check dilation as often as the nurses and if they saw that every time the nurse noticed that the dilation was less than it had been and then they say it's a mistake, well of course it's not going to be in the book. And the nurses can't put anything in the book that disagrees with what the doctors say because the doctors get paid more. Now do you get it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's how important information gets left out of textbooks that's I think really, really important. Because look what it took to fix that situation. Instead of saying this woman had a dysfunctional labor pattern, I went, hmm, cervix open before. How's her behavior different from what it was when she was opening? Okay, laughing and joking made her open. And then when she got scared because it felt like, oh, this is going to be the biggest poop that she, you know, because that's what it feels like. When a woman starts to push, she feels like she's got a watermelon in there that she's going to have to poop out. And it does feel like that's where it's going to come from, doesn't it? Anybody testify on that? Yeah. Okay. So, so what do you do then? You relieve the fears and she opens up again.